but anyway, okay, so keep, we're going on, moving on a little bit. Now, um, I feel while we talked about it before, uh, we talked about will and we talked about true will. And I define true will as the unity of all desire. And to me, that is what it is. It is the, you're resolving what no longer works for you, you're unifying everything that's left, and you're attempting to do... I don't like the word destiny, but you could use the word destiny. You're trying to accomplish your true will. Um, but there are different ways that we can talk about will, and there are different ways that we can think about it magically, beyond just trying to do your true will. Um, essentially, what we, what we, what we mean uh, when we're talking about this is we're talking about um, your persona, the persona that you are inhabiting, or more to the point, persona that you are choosing to put on at this time. Um, one of the things, that, one of the sacred things that magicians do is they take a magical name, and it's one of the ways that you can, it's just one more romp de dump to like make, uh, to put you in the mindset that I'm not Robert Randall. I am the magician Asamon Kiff or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, the idea is that uh, we, it's, it's, it helps in that change of mindset, especially if other people address you by your magical name and stuff like that. That's cool too. Um, but uh, essentially, the idea of the magical persona, um, I don't know how much we really, really want to get into this, but t people tend to base it on their concept of like, their concept of the highest idea of God that they can do. And then once they figure out something better, they take a new magical name or whatever. Um, but the idea is that the magician truly understands that the ego, we were talking about ego a lot, but ego, persona, mask, whatever, you, however you want to consider it, it, it is a mask. A magician knows that the persona can be shed with impunity and a new one taken on. You could, in a weird kind of way, you could almost consider it like having multiple personalities, but as opposed to being at the mercy of them, they, call, they come when you call them, as opposed to the other way around, right? Um, but, uh, and that, that also relates to the concepts of evocation and invocation. We'll get into that a little bit more as we go on. But uh, the, probably the way to think about this, um, the, thinking about will when it comes to uh, persona, uh, you might want to use the word um, incarnate or po possibly the word uh, embody. The idea is that you want to inhabit the persona till it, till it becomes uh, real, I guess, it, it, to the point where like, it, it, like you think like it, you feel like it, you know uh, what you would do when you're like that. And that's also one of the, one of the tools when we're working on ourselves, trying to get, uh, you know, our, our failings out of the way, or, um, you know, there's a, a goal that we want to achieve that, like, my personality is not the type that could accomplish something like that, then you would take on a personality that could. Make sense? That sounds kind of crazy, I know. But essentially, once we know this stuff anyway, we know all these personalities, They're, it's just, it's like mixing paint. I don't know, maybe that's a bad metaphor, but, um, but uh, anyway, but, and that's actually, you know what, you could even, where, where, like the Christians have the concept of being born again, right? You died to your old self, and you're born again as this new person, right? It's kind of the same thing, in ways it might be exactly the same thing, except we might do it more than once. We might get born again and again and again and again. Because that is ultimately, in my mind, uh, the concepts uh, when we're talking about like the resurrection and the life, like that kind of idea is that you are constantly resurrected in the moment. It can always be now. You could have failed every minute of every day up till now, but it's now. You can always be born again. Does that make sense? Right? That kind of idea. Um, Okay, and then it is, pro now that we've talked about that, it is probably worthwhile that we talk about um, the concepts, very briefly, very briefly, we'll talk about the concepts of the right-hand path and the left-hand path, and what they refer to. You might have heard that before, or, you, or I, I think I probably use it enough, uh, that, uh, or I use it in the last talk or whatever, but all right, so I had to redraw, I couldn't find my notes, so I redrew this real quick. But we were talking about the pillar of severity, and the pillar of mercy, right? Last time in the pillar of mildness in the middle, but the pillar of severity, you would consider the left-hand path. It's on the left. 
and the parallel order of mercy, you consider the right-hand path. And so, the way you might define these, or the way I define them, uh, is you could say that the right-hand path seeks the denial of the self to become one with the Godhead. And that's most of our religions, right? Uh, give up meat on Friday, or uh, vows of celibacy, or uh, I don't eat pork, or whatever. Like, there's a thousand and one examples of that denying the self, or, or I, I, it's not so much that I don't want to do this thing, it's that I won't do it because God said so, or whatever. That denial of the self as well. As opposed to, on the left path, you would say that the left-hand path is those who would seek to empower the self to become godlike. And in a way, you, they could, in one way, they could seem more opposite, right? Like, either, you know, I bury the self, uh, you know, spirit over, uh, we show that, black versus white, right? Spirit over matter as opposed to matter over spirit, that kind of thing. But ultimately, are we really, truly, maybe we're all just doing the same operation anyway, or we're just trying to get to where we're getting in different ways, because we're all in the same system. Like, good luck escaping it, right? Could you think of an idea outside of this? No, because you started there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, anyway. Um, now, all right, all right. I could talk all day about the paths and how they relate and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, essentially, um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to summarize this. I'm going to summarize this with a quote that um, I, I hope that meant a lot to me and made a huge difference to me when I read it. Um, so maybe it'll help you. Um, the fact that, and here's the quote, okay. The fact of a person being a gentleman is as much an illocutable factor as any possible spiritual experience. In fact, it is possible, even probable, that a man may be misled by the enthusiasm of illumination, and if he should find apparent conflict, between his spiritual duty and his duty to honor, it is almost sure evidence that a trap is being laid for him, and he should unhesitantly stick to the cause which ordinary decency dictates. Alistair Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you can think about it that way, right, that regardless of your inspiration or your divine ideas, we still have this sort of like, and I talk about the gentleman a lot, because to me, the gentleman walks the middle path. It's sort of the walk softly and carry a big stick kind of thing. I, don't start, I won't start a fight, but I'll finish one kind of thing. Um, the middle path. Uh, and that, this would be a whole class in and of itself, which would be fun. Uh, but essentially, that's how I try to think about it, is the balancing of severity and mercy to find the true will. And I, I would argue that the middle path, the great magician, is the only one who seems overtly concerned with finding and doing his true will. In that, because the left hand rejects the God who gave him that, and the right doesn't care, and God will just tell him what to do. Does that make sense? That's how I view it. I'm not saying that's, you need to use that, just, that's what works for me. So, okay, now that we've moved on, how are we doing on time? Uh, for, okay, cool. Um, let's, all right, so let's try to get through this. Well, okay. Okay, cool. So, um, actually, why don't we try to start the ritual closer to 2.30 or whatever. Anyway, so, um, I'm going to, sorry, guys. I'm going to try to get through this as best I can. All right, so, I, I organized this based on a bunch of different information that I found. Um, and, ultimately, I ended up needing a system so I could organize my blog information so I knew where everything went. Uh, but we'll use this as a way to kind of uh, describe this. Everybody, like, this isn't about the pentagram. It just, it happens to have five parts, so I made it this one. All right, so um, the major operations we'll talk about um, are the, the headings of them. We could call this divination, right? We've got divination. We've got the double. We have, this is a fun word, transmorgrification. Hope I spelled that right. It's close enough. Transmorgrification. I'll define all this stuff, don't worry. Um, we would have yeah, sorcery. And then this, the last one is enchantment. So, 
And don't worry, we'll go through them all. But now that we have these headers, um, it's easier to kind of slot other stuff into it. So we'll go, we'll go through this real quick. All right, so um, starting with divination, right? All right, we would consider divination, or we, I would define it anyway, uh, is the practice of gaining some form of non-local insight. Maybe it's from your subconscious or whatever. Basically, it's just it's non-conscious information that you get somehow. Either it comes from about who knows, who knows. There's any number of ways that we can talk about this. Um, but I would say, I would, I would, I would, I would stress that it is probably always a good idea to do some form of divination before you would start any kind of spell work. The idea being, you never necessarily know how or whether you had thought everything through or, or what have you. And a divination is a good way to uh, find where you might have missed something or more to the point, something to watch out for. Um, uh, but it is actually, it's actually my belief that the inspiration that leads you to do a magical operation in the first place is just as important, if not more important, because that's the one that saw the future where you were successful, right? The, ma the magic's just a formality. Right, it's more about, and we were talking about that too, where you're vibrating into the future, where you are uh, sympathetic with that emotional state that you were trying to create. Anyway, um, so uh, under under divination, we, we could slot a lot of things, but um, and actually, in a weird way, I might even put it here in the middle. Uh, but meditation, meditation, I kind of slot under divination in that meditation has. So many applications, and in essence, you use it for any of the other ones you're going to be doing anyway, right? It's the it's number one tool, um, and essentially, uh, it's used for if nothing else, if nothing else, then to achieve that state of calm that you need to start, right? Um, that the the what the um, uh, what am I thinking of? The, uh, the, the, the the that paradox, right? You must relax. You ever get that? You must relax. How, how, how am I supposed to relax? But when you can get over that, when you get over that apparent paradox and be able to relax in the moment, try to anyway. Um, and then probably based on this um, meditation stuff is also where you might say specifically as far as magic is concerned, um, the third eye meditation, where you're trying to open the third eye. And oftentimes, um, I do, and uh, other, other people I've read about or talked about, they, they get it too, where they get the sort of um, hypnogogic imagery to it. To me, it's like bands of rainbow colors coalescing in the middle of my consciousness, which to me is um, the, in Egyptian art, the snake comes out of the third eye. Same thing. It's, it's that, um, and we can talk about splines, and we can talk about that stuff too. Uh, but I really just want to try to take this stuff off as best I can. So um, you know, another, another element to meditation is the state of trance. Right? We talk about that a lot. But the trance uh, is important to achieve uh, during your, your operations. And particularly um, when you are uh, attempting to achieve gnosis. I know we talked about that before. But gnosis is the com combination of the uh, conscious and unconscious. It's where you receive information from above, so to speak. Um, uh, trance is also useful, um, not just to get into trance, but to break trance. I mean, trance is interrupted. That is another point where gnosis can come through, so to speak. Um, but we trance out every day. We trance out all the time. I mean, just think about your house. Think about the art or pictures or whatever they are hanging on the wall of your house. How many hundreds of times have you walked by that picture and never saw it? Like, you saw it, you saw it, it's in your eye, but you didn't stop and register like, oh, that's my nephew, or whatever, like that kind of thing. And so, while you didn't see it with your conscious mind, your unconscious mind is seeing all that stuff. And that's kind of one of the tricks that we try to use. We try to use the language of the unconscious to get information communicated. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'll keep almost skipping ahead. I'm not going to skip ahead. I'm going to stay on point. Okay, so um, another thing that you could uh, include under meditation is the concept of scrying. Uh, basically, uh, like so, for example, I just brought it so that you guys can see. Um, but like, uh, you could use like a, a black mirror 
uh, like Nostradamus used one of these, I think. Uh, crystal balls, reflective pools of water, whatever, whatever works. The idea is that um, while you're trancing out, you might see things in this that you know are related to whatever it is that you're doing. Um, but that would be scrying. Um, that would also you could consider scrying um, uh, remote viewing. You might have heard that term, right? Remote viewing. It's the same thing. Same thing. Seeing something non-local, right? Because I'm standing here. How could I see what was in Idaho or whatever? Hmm? Is that thing a black mirror? This is a black mirror. Yes. What, what is it for? Uh, it would be for, for scrying. Uh, you could use it. Some people use it in goetic work. I don't do goetic work, but you could do that too. Um, and uh, but other things work for scrying. Any reflective surface could technically work, or you could scry into a crystal, or scry into a ball, or whatever. Right? It doesn't matter. Like the the more to the point, you will feel. It. You'll know. When you feel good about something, that's going to work better for you than just something that, you know, somebody told you was supposed to work. If it works for you, it works for you. Um, there's no right or wrong answer to any, any of this stuff. And as we said before, there's no room for authority in occultism, right? So, um, okay, so anyway, that was, that was divination. Uh, another type of divination, although it's not necessarily related to meditation and scrying and stuff like that, would be anything astrological. Right? When we're doing our magical, uh, we're planning for a magical ritual or whatever, uh, we look ahead at the planetary days and the planetary hours. I already did that today, so you guys don't have to worry about it. But if you want, I, I did, I made a chart, it's on my website, um, that's color-coded. There's other charts, but I did mine in color, so it'd be a quick, easy reference for the days and hours. Um, but anything uh, planetary, zodiacal, and the like, uh, you, we would consider this a form of divination because we're sort of looking ahead. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so... Um, and specifically, as far as astrology is concerned, where magic, magic work is concerned, is while most of the planets take their sweet time, uh, the moon is the fastest moving. It's about two and a half days, and it's moved to a new sign. So um, the moon is worth paying attention to, perhaps, perhaps, more than some of the others. And the idea is, because remember, the moon ties to the unconscious mind, so it's all a vehicle for magic in the first place, right? And additionally, uh, it's worth paying attention to whether the moon is waxing or waning. Um, technically, it is still waning right now, but we are in the last, tomorrow's the new moon, right? Now, if everything worked out, today would be the new moon, and that would be great, but we're going to pretend that it's, it's, it's almost the new moon. Um, but the idea is that the difference then, why, why you care, is when, uh, if you want to bring something to you, you would want to do your operation when the moon is waxing. And if it's something that you wanted to banish from you, you would do it while it was waning. Make sense? That's, ba that's basically it. And the only other thing, the only other thing, one of the only really important things to think about is checking to make sure, and there are apps to do this, uh, but to make sure that the moon is not void of course. Meaning that when the moon changes signs, like we're leaving Pisces, we're about to go into Aries, right? So when the moon leaves Aries, Pisces and goes into Aries, unless it is aspected by a different planet, it is considered void of course, which means it's unstable or whatever. And typically is considered a bad time to do magic. Now, the moon actually goes void of course, void of course tonight at 5.30, but we're going to be done by that, so it won't matter. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, let's see, yeah. Okay, so that, yeah, we covered that. Okay, another thing you might consider under divination uh, is that sort of numerology, gematria kind of stuff, um, which I'm not an expert on and I don't really want to talk about, other than when we were talking about synchronicity. One of the things that you guys might start to notice um, is you'll see um, 11s a lot. You might happen to look at the clock when it's 11 or 222 or 444 or whatever you'll see stuff like that when you see or 12 12s all that kind of stuff when you start to see that kind of repeating digit i don't know what it means except you might take it as like i'm seeing synchronicity synchronicity has now entered my life and now that it's here there's more that can be done now that i recognize that there's more that we can do uh, I believe, or whatever, whatever, whatever. But to me, that's valuable when you see that stuff. And you'll hear that in a lot of the esoteric circles, the 11, 11, and whatever. Um, okay, another major thing uh, for divination is, of course, uh, the tarot deck. Everyone's 
familiar with that at one point or another. And while it might be fun to uh, wax intellectual about the difference between, like, for instance, you know, the Rider Waite and the Thoth deck or whatever, because they're both diff interesting and different, and this has errors or problems or whatever, and this has its own. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, they are still valuable. And because we were touching on some of the, because the tarot, the higher arcana goes on these paths as well, they have zodiacal or planetary uh, correspondences as well, which I don't know if you guys noticed, but I actually set that up on the altar today. We'll talk about that when we get to the altar a little bit more. Um, but I would say as where divination was concerned, um, you are probably going to do, it's probably, you're probably going to have the best results, theoretically, anyway, if you make the deck yourself, as opposed to using somebody else's deck. Now, that being said, um, you probably should study the tarot before you make your own deck, because a lot of people, like, you go to, you know, Barnes & Noble, Walden Books, or whatever, and you see there's tons of decks out there, and some of them are really cute and fun and whatever, but they lack a lot of the symbolism that the hermetics, hermeticists worked into uh, worked into the cards. And if you don't understand the symbolism, you might not reproduce it in your deck or whatever. So there's that. Do your own research is all I can say. It's 222. Right. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, yes, you know, there we go. All right. So, um, all right. So then real quick. Okay. So other divinations might be the I Ching, um, or, or tea leaves and omens or spilling entrails or wh whatever you use, right? Like it's rompty dump, right? It's all rompty dump anyway. The tarot is rompty dump, uh, like all this stuff. It's just, it's whatever, whatever tools your unconscious mind can use to get that information to where you understand, right? You're like, oh, I recognize that. That means this and this means this and that. And that's what he was trying to tell me. And when you know, you just know. It's like a ton of bricks, right? But anyway, so itching, tea leaves, omens, uh, and we might also consider uh, like spirit sessions, mediums, channeling, that kind of stuff, as well as sort of the ITC work because that's communicating as well. I, I'm sorry, inner, uh, what is it? ITC is inter instrumental trans communication. Uh, you've seen those like the ghost boxes and stuff like that. Um, that would be a whole other thing too, but it is interesting and we're starting to see more and more magicians start to realize that there's more to those tools than just you know, is anybody hunting my house or whatever? Um, but, but what's important and what's important about this, not that, I, sorry, I didn't mean to make a flip of that. What's important about this is we, I have noticed at least, and other magicians and my wife has certainly noticed we, when we are looking into this stuff and, um, you know, listening to other mediums and listening to spirits and whatever, the one thing that it seems like everybody needs as far as ghosts, spirits, whatever you want to call them, are concerned is they're all looking for the light. They need the light. They want you to call the light. Now, we could stand here for an hour and argue about why, but they wouldn't ask if they didn't need it. And when you call it, they use it. And it's one of the things that I noticed as part of my work where I would hear mediums talk about you know, an effect or whatever, and I'm like, well, that sounds just like the middle pillar exercise or whatever. And so to me, I felt that there was crossover, that the light was the light was the light. And so spirits can't find the way to the light, and sometimes they get lost and they get confused and they're stuck here forever, and it sounds horrible. So if we can do it, we should do it. Is a current good? And mo mostly, um, I think for whatever reason, it seems to be like really, really necessary. For whatever reason, a lot of spirits seem to not have the light. We could argue why, but that, that doesn't matter. What matters is that they need it, and so that if you can do, if you can call the light for them, you should. And more to the point, I have started to incorporate um, an element of ritual to my stuff in case anybody showed up. Like, because when we do magic, we light up on the astral plane. Right? So in theory, anybody who's paying attention can see this big column of light coming out of this building or whatever, and they come here to check out what's going on. We send them home. That's just part of the practice. So anyway, so that's that. Um, God, we have so much more to cover. I don't know if I can get through all this stuff. All right, so let me define this stuff for you at least. All right, so the double would be any, any work that you would be doing on your bio light, your chakras, your etheric fields, uh, 
astral projection, lucid dreaming, path working. Uh, we talked about the middle pillar exercise a little bit. That's essentially a ritual where you call down the light to activate your chakra centers. Um, as well as, I would say, like a ritual baths or ritual showers, that kind of stuff. A ritual cleansing that you would do before you would start your work, that kind of thing. Um, transmogrification would be, um, we might define transmogrification as the evolution of consciousness and the development of the true will. This could be anything, this could be evocation, invocation, which I feel like I really need to touch on real quick. Um, or more point, point out the differences, if there really truly is one. Um, okay, so what we would say is an, an evocation, evocation is you are calling something that is deep down in your heart somewhere, deep down in your psyche, whatever, and you're calling it up to inhabit you. And invocation is there's something out there that's not you, and you're calling it in. This would be channeling or taking on God forms or, or, or whatever. That's the general uh, difference as far as, as we would define them. But functionally, are they different? Who knows, right? Are they different? Oh, who knows? Um, but uh, that would, invocation and evocation would also include uh, Enochian work or the Goetia, stuff like that, where, you're, where you are literally working with spirits. Uh, as well as, um, for our purposes, we would say, uh, where we were trying to find uh, or gain knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel. Uh, and there are rituals to do that as well. Uh, the Abramelin is probably the most famous one of that. Uh, but I would also say yoga is working on, on this, is, although it does have things to do with the double as well, body of light. And there are, um, you know, that's probably too dangerous. I'm just going to skip that. You can look it up if you want. IOB, IOB stands for Identify, Objectify, Banish. And that is, that would effectively be the same as an exorcism, right? If you have a, you create a, if there's a, a I said I wasn't going to talk about this and then we'll talk about it anyway. All right, so, uh, so real, real quick, the idea is that if there is a personality trait that you have that you don't want anymore, you can create a thought form of it and you can cast it out of your circle and destroy it. And then it's not a part of you anymore. That's essentially the idea. And then, all right, so real quick. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm really whipping through this stuff. But um, sorcery, we would define as the use of natural materials to affect magic change, uh, which would involve, um, typically involves charging an item with energy and intention, as, we, as I've said. So this would be things like amulets and talismans. Again, the only difference is an amulet banishes and talisman draws. So you would just do it at different phases of the moon, otherwise it's essentially the same. And you could argue, like, uh, an amulet that banishes disease and a talisman that, uh, in, that uh, draws health are probably functionally the same thing either way. It's just really how you think about it, right? Um, but this would also uh, tie into, like, Eucharistic operations, where, and I brought a couple of examples. Uh, we were talking about water, how water has its memory. You can also charge water with uh, s crystals and stones of appropriate correspondences, as well as actually writing astrological symbols on the side. So like this, this is like for health, right? It's got the tourmaline and carnelian, I think, as well as, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, the word health uh, etched in the glass, that kind of stuff. Um, and um, this would also be, you know, when you bless your food before you eat it, or when you go to mass, you know, Catholic mass, Gnostic mass, whatever, that's a use of Eucharistic operation. The item is being charged with energy and intent, and you ingest it to take that energy into yourself, into your etheric field. It's kind of the same thing, right? Um, and again, we would also say the tea ceremony, instilling chi, into the water, that's, that's that kind of thing. Um, but uh, probably one of the most popular forms of sorcery, or at least one of the most effective, is candle magic. And we'll be doing some of that today. Um, but uh, candle magic is, <laughs> there, there's a lot to cover. But essentially, uh, candles are great because they are already a represent, representation of the four elements, fire and air, earth, because it's wax, and then when it melts, it's like water. Um, but because wax is also very uh, receptive 
it can hold a charge much easier. And um, good, oh good, we're gonna get, get to it right here. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of matter and antimatter. 